This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening. Uh, my name is Karen Smith McCune, and tonight uh, Dr. Chapman and I are going to talk about cancer prevention. So, as you are well aware, this is session um, four out of six. Um, and t tonight we're going to sort of cover if there are ways of preventing these cancers, what the symptoms are um, as a way of catching it early, uh, et cetera. And we're going to cover three the three most common women's cancers, cervical, ovary, and uterine. And I'm going to start with cervical cancer because that's my clinical niche. I run the UCSF dysplasia clinic, so I evaluate women with abnormal pap smears, and we'll talk about what all that means as the talk unfolds. I just wanted to uh, review the anatomy that we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm sure you've seen schematics like this already in the course. This is a sort of cartoon picture of the uterus. Uh, this is where the fetus would implant and grow. The tip of the uterus it projects down into the vagina. So these gray um, lines are meant to represent the walls of the vagina. And the cervix, which is the end of the uterus, projects into the vagina and is actually visible. So we call this part of the cervix the ectocervix. The part that connects to the uterus is called the endocervix. And the cervix has a very unique and interesting biology because the cell type that lines the vagina and the cell type that lines the uterus are quite different. And the cervix is one of the very few places in the body where these two cell types meet. And this is drawn schematically over here. So we've taken this little triangular area and enlarged it. And to show you that the vagina and the outside of the cervix are um, covered with squamous epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium. The inside of the cervix is lined with columnar epithelium. And where those two meet is called the transformation zone. And that's where most cervical cancers are going to develop, because that's where human papillomavirus likes to infect. We'll talk a lot more about HPV or human papillomavirus as the talk progresses. So the unique thing about the cervix in terms of prevention and screening is that we can see it. So the women in the room are very familiar with this process where we have a speculum placed and the provider can find the cervix, visualize it, and then using methods we'll talk about, uh, test it to see if there's any signs of um, changes that could lead to cancer. So that makes it a very unique organ in the body and explains the reason why cervical cancer screening has been so successful. So let's talk about what are the risk factors for having cervical cancer. The number one, two, three, four, five, and six item is HPV infection. And again, we'll talk a lot about HPV or human papillomavirus in just a minute. Smoking is a cofactor as well. Smokers are more likely to have cervical cancer. Um, early age at first birth early age at first intercourse are also predictors and or risk factors. Those are probably surrogates for the fact that you've had sex at a younger age and you're more likely to have been exposed to HPV for a longer period of time. High parity, parity means the number of babies you've had. So women who have had four or more babies are significantly more likely to develop cervical cancer. We don't really understand why that is, but it's an independent predictor in a lot of studies. Low socioeconomic status is an independent predictor of getting cervical cancer. Genetic factors is a question mark next to them, and you'll hear from Dr. Chap when, when she talks about ovarian, and, and well, actually, I think you've had this talk about genetic factors. Um, for cervical cancer, there aren't really well-identified genetic factors, but there's no question that there are families where people every generation have had cervical cancer. The reason it's probably been uh, difficult to unmask a genetic predictor is that the HPV infection 
overwhelms the risk factor. HPV is, it, it's found in every cervical cancer. So if there are genetic factors, it has to be strong enough to emerge independently of the HPV factors. So we haven't found these factors yet, but we all think they are there. And then there's questions about other sexually transmitted infections, maybe chlamydia. Um, these, these come and go um, as potential predictors, but in general, we all believe that the main predictor, sexual infection-wise, is HPV. Now, interestingly, there are some factors that are protective. If you've had a cesarean section, the likelihood of getting cervical cancer is about half what it is if you've never had a C-section. Circumcision of the male fa uh, partner is a protective factor against getting cervical cancer. And the reason for that is that circumcised males uh, seem less likely to carry HPV and to infect their partner. And then ever having had a pap smear, and we'll talk about what is a pap smear, it's a screening test. But if you've ever had a pap smear in your life, just even one, the likelihood of getting cervical cancer drops by tenfold. So very protective because it picks up changes before cancer has a chance to develop. Um, another obvious um, angle towards prevention is to pick up signs and symptoms early and seek medical care. Uh, there are definite signs and symptoms of cervical cancer, irregular vaginal bleeding, bleeding after the menopause, bleeding after sex, vaginal discharge, pelvic pain, um, unilateral leg swelling or pain, that's a sign of advanced cervical cancer where it's, it's, it's extended all the way to the nerves on the side wall of the pelvis, and then a mass or swelling, obviously. So as I mentioned, and as I showed you, the cervix is visible, it's accessible for screening, and we can in cases where there's advanced cancer, it's obvious to the naked eye, it's visible. And this is again a very unique situation. There aren't very many places on the body where cancer can be visualized. The skin comes to mind, uh, the oropharynx, the eyes, but really cervix is um, accessible and visible. So one thing we do when we do a pelvic exam on a woman is just look at the cervix to make sure it looks normal. It's unusual to see this type of presentation of cervical cancer in our country, and I'll get to reasons for that shortly, but it's actually very common in um, low resource settings that women present when they have cancer at this stage. So I've talked a lot about HPV or human papillomavirus. This is where I'm gonna kind of summarize the life cycle of HPV. Uh, this is a little cartoon of a fake viral particle. It will infect the normal cervix, it's transmitted through sexual activity, so an active HPV infection on the penis or the scrotum can transmit to the woman and arrive at the cervix and cause an infection on the cervix. HPV infected cervix, it will shed cells that look abnormal. They don't look precancerous, they look viral. And these can be detected very easily um, on the pap test. But most of the time, this infection clears on its own over the course of, we usually say, 80 to 90% of the time, this infection will self-clear within two years in women who've been recently exposed. In a smaller, see how those arrows are getting smaller? In a lower percentage of cases, the infection doesn't clear and it can progress, it can take hold, change its behavior. The virus is no longer making viral copies of itself. It's actually stimulating the cervical cells to grow when they shouldn't. And this is called a precancerous lesion. These also can go away on their own. If the immune system becomes aware of their presence and does its thing, it can cause regression back to, all the way back to a normal cervix. But if that doesn't happen, and if it sits here for a while, and we usually say five to 10 years, it can progress to cancer. So this whole spectrum of disease, like I said, it, it has a long lifespan. It takes five to 10 years. And what we're doing when we're screening for cervical cancer is we're picking up these intermediate stages before cancer has had a chance uh, to develop. Now, there are some known cofactors that 
um, enhance the malignant potential of HPV. And those are smoking and immunocompromised. So women with HIV infection, women on medications because they've had an organ transplant or because they have lupus, they are less likely to fight the HPV infection, less likely for it to go in the regression direction. And so they're at higher risk for the development of cervical cancer. We don't understand exactly why smoking is a cofactor, but we do know that the metabolites of cigarette smoke are concentrated in the cervical mucus. So a smoker is essentially bathing her cervix in co-nicotine and tar and all these bad carcinogens. They're enriched and localized at the cervix. So that's probably what contributes to its um, enhancement. <coughs> So we know a lot about HPV now. We, we found this link, the link between HPV and cancer in the 1980s, and since then there's been a huge explosion of information about HPV. And we know that there are many, there are about 100 HPV types. Some of them cause common hand warts, foot warts. They're not likely to infect the genital skin. They're very, the um, viruses are very particular about the locations where they can infect and cause disease. So if you're wondering, mm, if I had a hand wart, could I, no. You can't transmit it to the penis or to the vulva or the cervix. They are very tropic in terms of where they want to be. But in terms of the genital HPV types, the most common types are listed here, and they're divided into whether or not we see them in cancers. So the lowest types are 6 and 11, and that, we'll come back to that when we talk about the HPV vaccine. They're generally associated with warts and hardly ever, if ever, found in cancer. Uh, 16 and 18 are the most common types that are found in cancer. They're also the most common types out there. So having 16 and 18 doesn't mean, oh my god, you're going to get cancer. But uh, those types are more likely to persist and avoid the immune response and progress ultimately to cancer. And then there's a host of other types that have a sort of more intermediate but definite potential to develop into cancer. So screening is a very effective way to prevent cervical cancer. By screening, we mean, like I mentioned before, looking at the cervix, testing the cervix for changes that might indicate HPV is there and has started this trip towards a cancerous lesion. And the reason uh, we know that, that for there are a number of reasons, but this, this um, global map is a good demonstration of the significance of having screening in a population. So at the bottom here, this is called a heat map, and the colors indicate the risk of cancers per 100,000 women, cervical cancer. So the white, the countries that are in white, the risk of cervical cancer is less than nine per 100,000 women. And then at the other end of the um, spectrum, the dark red, so you see countries in Africa and South America, the rates are tenfold higher, 87 per 100,000 women. And the main differences between these countries is not something about HPV, it's about screening. The, the countries with the lower prevalence have population-based screening programs, and the countries with the highest rates don't. So screening really works to prevent cervical cancer. We have two screening modalities currently in the US. One is the pap test, also known as cytology. And the current guidelines are that if you're going to screen with cytology, you see a woman every three years. This has recently changed. It used to be every year, and then we moved to every two to three years, and now the new guidelines are very unequivocal every three years if you're doing PAPs. The other test we can do is a, is a PAP test with HPV testing. So HPV testing looks for those high-risk types that I mentioned before. It doesn't look for the low-risk types. We don't really care if somebody has that. They're not going to get cancer from it. But it will detect um, one or more, any of the high-risk HPV types that were listed in that panel. And the advantage of the co-test, what we call the co-test is cytology plus HPV, is that if it's negative on both tests, you have a very high security that the patient is safe. 
doesn't need another screening for five years. So you can enhance, you can increase the screening interval over PAPs alone. So just a schematic for what a PAP test is. Imagine the cervix that I showed you earlier, visualized through the speculum. We use a spatula, just like a tongue blade or popsicle stick, and a brush to collect cells from the outside and the inside of the cervix. We put them on a slide or into a liquid vial, and, and those are processed in the lab, and either a cytopathologist looks at them through the microscope, or we now have automated screening machines that can scan them digitally to look at the morphology of the cells. And I'm not a cytologist, but I think we can all agree that this pattern of cells, so look at the little nuclei, these are the little dark areas. Um, we see cells with small nuclei and lots of cytoplasm around them, whereas over here, we see cells with big nuclei, and the nuclear, what we call the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, is very different between these two samples. So this, this type of finding would tell us that this person has something going on on the cervix that could be a precancer, maybe even cancer. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for with the PAP test. Um, with the HPV test, we get a report that says HPV high-risk DNA types detected or not detected. So not detected would be the result we'd want. Detected means they have HPV. So we get a sort of um, amalgamation of data back from these screening tests. And based on the results, if they're more equivocal, we tend to repeat the testing in six to 12 months. If there's stronger results, then we do what's called colposcopy and hopefully treatment. Uh, colposcopy is a test that uses a binocular microscope. And again, we visualize the cervix through the speculum. We look through the microscope under bright illumination. We apply a wash solution to the cervix. And we look for areas that change from the normal pink to white. It's really that simple. And here's an example of, again, here's the, the cervix. This is the opening that's going up towards the uterus. And unlike that picture I showed you earlier where everything was pink and red, in this case, we see thick white epithelium. It's turned white with our wash. And we suspect that this is going to be um, a precancerous lesion. And we can take biopsies of it and send it to the lab, and they can tell us what's going on. So once we get that information, if there is precancer there, we treat so that we prevent. It's kind of like having a, a, fun, a funky mole on your skin. You want it, they take it off to make sure it doesn't become cancer. Or if it's an early melanoma, they take it off so it doesn't have a chance to spread. So that's the same principle. Um, once we found these abnormal areas on the cervix, we, um, we can treat them with either ablation, that just means burn them off, or freeze them off, or we can do excisional therapy, which means we remove it with, uh, I'll show you how we do that. These are the instruments we use for cryotherapy. Cryotherapy is the most common treatment used globally. It's very effective, it's very low resource, it's easy to do, you don't have to be a surgeon. Um, this machine has, it's attached to a, a, um, a tank of, of liquid carbon dioxide, and when you turn on the uh, valve, it delivers the carbon dioxide to the tip, and the carbon dioxide's very cold. You apply the tip to the abnormal cervix, it freezes the abnormal cervix. That obviously kills the abnormal cells. They slough off and normal cells replace them. And so the treatment has about an 80%, 90% cure rate. It's very effective and it's uh, very well tolerated. We do this <laughs> in the office with the patient awake. The other um, common, much more in this country, this technique is more common. Um, it's called a leap for loop electrosurgical excision procedure. We use a wire that's attached to an electrosurgical generator. It gets heated up super hot, 
and then it cuts kind of like a knife. It's so hot that it just sort of melts the tissue. And we use it to sort of scoop a small area off the cervix that includes the abnormal area, like I showed you in that picture. So th these are also very easy procedures to do in the office. We have to use local anesthetic, but they're well tolerated. These are more um, high resource because of the equipment that's required, and the operator needs to be a little more surgically trained than for the cryotherapy. So these are, LEAPs are not done widely in a global setting, but they're the most common technique used for treatment in this country. So we've talked about screening and prevention by detecting precancers before they have a chance to progress. And, um, now I'm going to talk about primary prevention of cervical cancer with HPV vaccines. So there's now uh, three FDA vaccines against HPV. One of them detects the two, or it inoculates women against the two most common HPV types. Um, another, that, that are associated with cancer, sorry. The next one um, inoculates against those two, plus the two that cause genital warts. So the quadrivalent vaccine, which is called Gardasil, which is the one that was um, mainly used in this country until the more recent one came along, protects against um, the two most common types associated with cervical cancer, but also against genital warts. And since most genital warts are six or 11, we expect to see a huge decline in the burden of that disease. And then more recently, re pretty recently, the FDA approved um, an even more expanded valency vaccine that targets nine types, the four that are in the quadrivalent vaccine plus the next most common intermediate risk types, the types that may cause cancer. Yes. The question is, are they still recommended only for girls or for boys now? Girls and boys, I'll get to that in a second. The original trials were done in girls, and that was the reason they were rolled out as a vaccine for girls. But there were trials done um, in boys as well. So here it is. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, is the body, the government body that makes recommendations about uh, um, vaccines. And they recommend now routine HPV vaccination should be initiated at age 11 or 12 in boys and girls. And that age is picked because the vast majority of children in this country have not initiated sexual activity. And it needs to be given before you've been exposed to be effective. If you've already been exposed, it doesn't do any good and it doesn't help clear. We were kind of hoping that even if you'd been exposed and had an infection, the vaccine might help clear it, but that doesn't happen. Yes. Is this one of the required vaccines for children, or is it just optional? Um, there are no mandates in, that I know of in the country where or you can't come to school if you haven't had this vaccine, so it, it's still optional. Yes? Can you be too old to receive the vaccine? You guys are great. You're like setting me up here. Next slide. Um, Vaccination is also recommended for females aged 13 to 26. This is called the catch-up population. The trials were done in, those age, in that age group. And so the CDC has recommended that women who have not been vaccinated because they were too old, but they're still under the age of 26, can still get the vaccine. For males, the window is a little tighter, 13 to 21, um, who've not been vaccinated previously, or who didn't complete the three-dose series. There also is a language around the fact that males between the ages of 22 to 26 may be vaccinated. Now, to get to your question, older than 26, they did do a trial up to the age of 45, looking at women between the ages of 26 and 45. They were trying to get FDA labeling for expanded use, and the efficacy was not good enough. The FDA did not approve it for women above the age of 26. And CDC has no guidance about giving it to women over that age. 
Um, the vaccines are associated with, as you might expect, I mean, it's a pretty high dose of antigen that is being delivered. So it is associated with local reactions, including pain, erythema, and swelling. Some association with uh, systemic side effects as well, fatigue, headache, and myalgia. That's at the time of the injection, just like you can experience from flu or some of the other vaccines. But no obvious safety issues were identified in the phase three trials, and they have a long-term um, phase four post-marketing database that they check every year, and there hasn't been any signal that's emerged um, from there. What we want to know is what's going to be the impact of this. If you model it, something like two-thirds of cancers are associated with 16 and 18. So if it works perfectly, it should reduce the cancer burden by two-thirds. What we need to know is what's actually going to happen in the real world. And so it's under investigation. The, the vaccine's only been out for about 10 years. So the women that got vaccinated at the right age are just hitting the age where they're going to start getting pap smear screening. So it's, it's too, really too soon to know too much about the ultimate population impact. But there are some early studies suggesting a reduction in cervical dysplasia, I shouldn't have used that word, precancer, in populations that have high vaccine coverage. There's also some data in countries where they only vaccinated girls that boys, oh, sorry, had a, a decreased incidence of genital warts. So that's suggesting some kind of herd immunity. So the early impact studies are looking promising, um, but we don't know the effect yet on cervical cancer. It is expected to result in reduced rates of cervical cancer, but we don't know that yet for sure. So I've kind of reached the end of my part of the talk. I hope I've convinced you that primary prevention is hopefully possible through the vaccination before exposure to HPV. Once you've been sexually active, the, ho the horse is out of the barn, and then we rely on secondary prevention, which is um, based on screening for detection of precancers and treatment of any um, of those that are uh, detected. So I saw a hand go up. I don't know specifically which data set you're referring to, but there's definitely a link between higher rates of cervical cancer in recent immigrants, because most of them have not been screened. They come from countries where screening's not available, and women who don't have access to screening. So even in the US, with our beautiful map showing that as a country, we have very low rates of cervical cancer. There's definite geographic variation, and some of that has to do with socioeconomic status and access to care. Uh, Planned Parenthood is great because it offers cheap pap smears, and it's been really uh, pivotal in terms of providing access to screening to low-resource populations. Um, I know there is a cancer campaign. I'm going to let Joss talk more about that. In San Francisco, there's recently been a launch of an effort to tackle our own backyard in terms of these kinds of inequities. The question is a good one. Even after the vaccine, is it still a possibility to get cervical cancer? And the answer is yes, because it only targets two out of the 14 types that are associated with cervical cancer. They're the worst ones. They're the ones that cause most cancer. But um, you're still not protected against some of the other types. So definitely women who've been vaccinated are still coming in with abnormal PAPs and are still needing treatments to prevent the development of cancer, probably from those other HPV types that aren't included in the vaccine. Uh, I'll repeat the question. So in the diagram, the arrows were going both ways. So the question, is it possible for it to go one way and regress and then go back again down that pathway with the same HPV type was your question. That's more rare. It does happen. Most people, once they regress or get rid of the the infection, are protected. It's like their own vaccination. It's like a natural vaccination. But there are people where we do find that the same type does come back. We thought they cleared it, but it comes back. We would only know that in the setting of a study. 
in, in those studies, what they find way more often is that the pathway starts up again, but it's a new infection, a different type. So that's much more common because they haven't been inoculated against the other types. So both are, both are, are possible. Yes? So the question is, is HPV only caused by HPV? By, is cervical cancer only caused by HPV? And? And is HPV only transmitted sexually? Uh, yeah, we do think that HPV is necessary for the development of cervical cancer. So if you look at cervical cancers with a molecular probe, 99.9% .9 of them will have HPV DNA in them. And yes, HPV is acquired sexually. There's really no other answer to that question. You could have got it, if you're really unlucky, from your first sexual exposure, and then 20 years later, it manifests. So it can lie dormant? Mm -hmm. It can lie dormant. Uh, we don't understand the biology of that part of HPV very well, but we definitely know that women, like to your question, Allison, women can have the HPV. We think it's gone, and then 10 years later, it's back, and it's the same type. We'd only know that, again, in the context of studies, because we don't do that kind of molecular drilling in clinical practice. But it does definitely appear that in some women, it lies dormant, and that reflects a failure of their immune system to clear it. And persistence of HPV is a, is a risk factor for getting cervical cancer. You can test negative, yeah, so can it be dormant and undetectable? Yes, you can have normal PAPs and negative HPV testing um, when it's dormant. It has so little of itself present that we don't even pick it up on the HPV DNA test. Those are not very common scenarios, just so you know. That's why the screening works so well. Most of the time, we find it, we treat it, and it doesn't come back. So it's, it's the exception. But you know, in a well-screened woman, getting cervical cancer is the exception. Most, most women who've had three normal paps in their life are so unlikely to ever get cervical cancer. So um, the question is, for women who are coming through now who've been vaccinated, are they still going to get the paps every three years, or will that change? And that's a great question. It's an area of very active research. Until we know more about the population impact, we're modeling the modeling suggests just keep the screening the same. But ultimately, you know, maybe in 25, 30 years, we're hoping that the overall prevalence of HPV will be low enough in the population that we could screen less often, screen different tests. You know, the, 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 there's no doubt that the model will change. But for now, they're recommending just Ignore the fact that you've had a vaccine, you still need to get PAPs. Because what we don't want to have happen is that people stop getting screened because they have a false sense of security. To get to your question, they can still get cervical cancer even though they've had the vaccine. It's, a, it's definitely a huge success of translational medicine. I'm a little agnostic about HPV testing for screening, full disclosure, because it's so common and so I'm, I deal with a lot of the downstream damage from women who are like, I have HPV, I don't know where I got, you know, and they're, not, they're fine, they don't have precancer, they're not going to get cervical cancer, but because we can test for it, we find it a lot, and it's a very common virus. And they're just thinking about the vaccine. Well, the vaccine, yes, we, we hope. I mean, let's also be very clear about the fact that we still don't know whether it reduces cancer. We think it should. Why wouldn't it? Well, if the other types that are still out there change their behavior, like they grow in and take over, or because someone's been vaccinated, they behave differently, the immune system is different, it's possible. So I'm, I'm always very careful to frame it as it should reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. And let's be clear. We think it will, but we don't have the data yet. There is a natural cohort, uh, there's a natural history cohort in the Nordic countries. They named their study Guarding Against Guessing. And they randomized cities, towns and cities in, I think it's Denmark, to getting just the Hep B vaccine or Hep B with, hep, with HPV. And they're following these girls 
for the next couple of decades, the first, the first results should be starting to come in. And they did it specifically to say, will it reduce cancer? Like here, it, all the other impact studies are sort of based on registry data or you know, the city and county of San Francisco Department of Public Health data. They're very messy data sets. It's really hard to say things looked like this before and now they look like this. It worked. So this cohort in um, the Nordic countries is going to be really a nice data set to look at. So when we get that result, we'll be able to say this does reduce cervical cancer. Until then, I'm a scientist. I'm data driven. I hope it's going to be true. But that's why I'm sort of like, you know, it's good, get vaccinated, we'll see what happens. Yes? Are, are there any screenings or, or uh, testing you recommend for male partners? The question is, are there any screening or testing for male partners? I wish there were. There isn't. There's no FDA-approved test for HPV in the male partner. Um, we don't have an equivalent thing of the pap smear of the external genitalia. We do screen for anal cancer, which is another HPV-associated cancer. It's not being covered in this series because it's not considered, it, it's a different organ. But it is HPV-associated, and there is a way to screen for that, uh, but it's not recommended on a population level. Great question. The question is how successful are we in getting um, young women vaccinated? Um, not bad. It's, it's going up. It's about 40% now. Uh, but it, it hung in the low 30s for a very long time. It's, it's now uh, ticking up. One of the things that's going to improve uptake is that the CDC re recently issued new guidance that in the age group that we want to target, the 11 to 12 year olds, you only need two doses and they can be a year apart. So that makes the logistics of administering it so much easier. It used to be time zero, one to two months later and then six months after that. And so there's an army of girls and women that got some of those but not all of them. It was a really hard regimen to complete and now it's gonna be much, much easier. And they're actually studying how whether you only need one dose. Some of the trial data suggests that it's so immunogenic that one dose might be enough. But this two dose regimen, which the WHO has been recommending uh, for maybe three to four years, uh, was finally adopted by the FDA and the CDC and it's, it's gonna make a big difference. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Chapman. The uh, subject tonight is about screening and prevention and um, uh, unlike, uh, I, I think, to one of the audience members' points about um, the cervix, which is a very unique organ in that we can visualize it, um, as women here who have had a speculum exam know, the speculum is not your most favorite thing in the world, but it's not horribly painful, um, generally speaking. And um, so these pap tests um, are pretty low burden in terms of um, you know, you do have to go to the doctor and they do have to have this instrument placed inside of you. Um, but in terms of pain, in terms of um, uh, how invasive we consider that to be, we consider that to be quite, lo quite low on the invasive scale. Um, but just up north from that cervix is the ovary is, um, and the uterus and the fallopian tubes. And they are um, in a very different way quite hidden. And as we were talking about in our anatomy lecture or the anatomy portion of the lecture in the first um, lecture for those of you guys who are here, I described, I kind of wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. You know, I described the pelvis as being this, um, uh, some, I think sometimes people think the pelvis is this area that um, the bowel kind of hangs out in and most is mostly occupied by the uterus um, and maybe the bowel a little portion of it. But actually the uterus um, is really almost underneath your pubic bone. Um, it's very deep in the pelvis um, and the majority of your pelvis is occupied by some small bowel and your colon. Um, and those ovaries have a lot of space in there to um, grow and cause masses before people have symptoms. So that's one of the challenges with ovarian cancer um, is that it can be um, quite, a long, quite far along in the disease process before anybody develops symptoms. The second problem with screening for ovarian cancer is that it's not very common. It's not in the category of rare diseases, but only about one in 70 women will get it in their lifetime. Um, so you're much more likely to get lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, 
Um, what am I missing? I think those are the top three. Um, but um, uh, so, so screening for diseases that are very common is much easier um, because um, um, you're looking at a, gener a population and you expect that a certain percentage of them every year is going to get this disease. Um, and when we look in the United States, we see about 14,000 um, ovarian cancer diagnoses per year out of a population as large as the United States. That's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack every year, right? Um, so um, I'm going to talk about these two cancers, and um, the ovarian and uterine cancers. And actually, screening is not recommending recommended for either of them, but there are definitely strategies for prevention and um, ways to think about um, how we might actually develop screening tests. Because even when you are looking for a needle in a haystack, what that really means is you have to have a very, very good test. If you have a very good test that's hardly ever wrong, you can find that needle in the haystack. If your test is wrong a lot of the time, and every time you try to find the needle, you grab a handful of hay, that means to all of those, all of those other people who are caught up in that test, they're going to have something done to them that they didn't otherwise need to have happen. Um, and so all of the ovarian cancer screening trials have basically so far proven that to be the case. Um, and um, at the end, end of this section, I'll take some, some questions, and maybe we can help you really drive home the point of why screening for ovarian cancer is so challenging. Um, but let's first talk about the risk factors. So um, the um, obvious one and uh, probably the strongest one is the increasing age. The older you get, the more likely you are to get this kind of cancer. Um, this is a disease, uh, cancer in general is a disease of aging. Um, and that's because as our cells um, replicate over the course of their of our lifetimes. They can develop mutations. We talked about that being one of the criteria that's needed for um, cancers to develop. And so the older we get, the more mutations we collect, and some of those may eventually lead to a cancer. Um, history of uh, family history of ovary, fallopian tube, and primary peritoneal cancer, or premenopausal breast cancer. Those are um, all risk factors. And this is sort of textbooks kind of stuff, um, and that is probably very related to the fact uh, that there's a genetic component to ovarian cancer. About 20% of ovarian cancers we have discovered have a genetic underpinning. What that means is that when a person was born, they had an error in their DNA that they acquired either from their mom or from the, their dad, the way we, we talked about BRCA mutations a couple weeks ago, and they, um, some people can live their whole lives with that mutation and never develop a cancer. But about um, 20%, 20 to 40% of women who have a BRCA mutation um, will develop an ovarian cancer over the course of their lifetime. And when we, we, before we knew about genes that could be transmitted from parent to child, um, we just knew that we would look at patients' family histories and we would see, oh, Dad had a cancer, uncle had a cancer, aunt had a cancer, and then, oh gosh, three of the siblings have a cancer, and, they, and these family trees were very revealing about um, the likelihood that their, their offspring were gonna develop cancer was much higher than a family who did not have that sort of family tree. Infertility or never becoming pregnant is a risk factor for ovarian cancer, um, and there's this theory with ovarian cancer that they're, um, and, you'll, uh, and it plays into one of the things that the, or, the next point item here is that oral contraceptive pill use is protective. So why might those two things be linked? Well, oral contraceptive pills cause the ovaries ass essentially to be quiet, quiescent. They're not ovulating. Um, whereas if you're infertile or have never been pregnant, that means that your ovaries are constantly ov ovulating. Ovulating every month, you've never even had a break. M women who are pregnant have at least a nine month break, sometimes much longer if breastfeeding is successful. So um, there's a period of time when um, the woman who is pregnant has, is no longer ovulating. Um, and if you're on oral contraceptive pills, obviously the same thing is true. You're not ovulating um, while you're on those oral contraceptive pills to help prevent pregnancy in the first place. And so that, um, those, those, the combination of those two things seems to go together with this theory that if the ovaries are not busy, if they're quiet and not ovulating, that that uh, is protective against ovarian cancer. 
The question is about fertility treatment with stimulating or ovarian stimulation drugs. You know, they've, they've looked at that, and aside from the infertility component, it does not appear to um, uh, uh, give uh, an extra risk beyond just the infertility risk factor itself. Um, okay, so um, there are one of the studies, some of the studies that are um, in this body of literature and, and looking at ovarian cancer and trying to figure out how to detect ovarian cancer earlier, there's an interesting study that was done where if you ask every woman who comes in um, who, with a new diagnosis of ovarian cancer, tell me what your symptoms have been in the last six months. Not today, not this week, not that you're bloated and that you've got this large cancer in your belly, but what, think back, think back to six months ago, what was going on with your symptoms? And the most common thing that people actually report, if you ask them this, is that, oh, you know, I talked to my doctor and um, six months ago and I was having some trouble with urination or I was having some burning or I thought maybe I had a urinary tract infection, but you know, I was tested for that and it was negative. I took some antibiotics, it didn't really get better. I, I thought I might have another infection. You know, this kind of urinary tract irritation, um, that is actually urgency and frequency there, uh, the f sensation of having to go even if you don't or having to go frequently and going in set kind of small quantities, that seems to be actually an early sign of ovarian cancer. Um, it was one of the things I counsel my patients about when I'm thinking about recurrence is you have any urinary symptoms that don't seem right to you, not the normal run-of-the-mill uh, urinary tract infection, let's, um, let's get you in for an evaluation. Um, uh, other things that people will report a little less frequently than urinary symptoms will be um, some sort of vague abdominal symptoms like I started feeling kind of full or and I was eating less but I was actually still, my weight wasn't changing or um, you know I was just kind of feeling bloated after meals um, and then pain is usually actually a sign that uh, the cancer is more advanced actually. Um, so. Um, there's a campaign out here, actually, there's this, uh, this um, February is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, um, and um, I can't remember where, uh, actually, I should have started with a disclaimer. Uh, Dr. Chen, who is supposed to, scheduled to be here tonight, is uh, stuck on the East Coast, so she prepared these slides, and I'm um, helping to deliver them. So I apologize if um, I'm not quite um, uh, familiar 100% with where every single image came from. But th this one I've seen before, and it's basically just that the primary thing that we tell people in terms of ovarian cancer, especially families for which ovarian cancer is at a higher risk, um, is to be aware of these symptoms. So as I talked about at the uh, beginning of my uh, part here, is uh, routine screening is not recommended. Um, and the reason is because there, um, so I'll just talk you through it for a minute. So people have looked at various screening strategies and the most obvious one is let's get some imaging at some interval of the ovaries and let's do a CA-125 test. A CA-125 we know is a marker um, for ovarian cancer um, and it is elevated in um, the vast majority of advanced ovarian cancers. However, it's only elevated in about 25 to 50 percent of stage one cancers. So that seems like a pretty crappy test. You might as well flip a coin, right? Um, Ultrasound is not a very invasive thing to do, um, and, um, but the problem is what to do with what we find because the job of the ovaries is to make cysts. Those um, ovaries, every single month, they make an egg and a follicle, and the follicle ovulates, and then after that, there's a, what's called a corpus luteum that would potentially help support an early pregnancy, and all of these are things that can be found on ultrasound, and they look like little cysts. Um, and so, um, any cysts that look abnormal, what that would mean for a reproductive aged woman um, is the only way to prove that it's not cancer would be to go in and take the ovary out. Um, well, that seems like a pretty invasive thing to do for a young woman who doesn't have a history of ovarian cancer um, because we're screening her for ovarian cancer. So what the studies that have looked at this ended up finding is that you operate on a lot of people and find a lot of benign things on the ovary to find that very rare instance where we find an early cancer. Um, and so we do a lot more harm than good for um, potentially helping the one person. 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so they've, they, the question is what about postmenopausal women? And they've also looked at uh, limiting the populations to just postmenopausal women. Um, and the, uh, because, again, only 14,000, remember the numbers, 14,000 women get diagnosed with ovarian cancer each year. That's approximate. It might be closer to. I think. It's 14,000 die. You're right. Thank you. Thank, I knew somebody in the audience was going to help me with those numbers. Thank you. Um, so tw at, at any rate, 22,000 uh, per year are diagnosed. Um, so that's a pretty small uh, amount of nu numbers, even if you eliminate um, half the population, which is male, and eliminate half anyone who's younger than 50. It's an still enormous number of people to be looking for cysts on ovaries. So the question is if there's a history. There, for BRCA patients, the, the people who have a known genetic risk, the, indication, the um, guidelines are totally different. What we're talking about here is the general population. For the, for the BRCA folks, um, and I can't remember if we talked about this two weeks ago when I was talking about hereditary cancer, but um, for the BRCA population, so somebody knows that they were born with a mutation that predisposes them to a cancer, it's recommended that they have their ovaries and fallopian tubes taken out. Um, so that's a very invasive thing to do. That's surgical menopause. Um, we actually recommend that somewhere around the age of 40. Um, that has been proven in studies to decrease people's risk of ovarian cancer by like 90% essentially. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's not something that we are doing for the general population is just taking out people's ovaries and fallopian tubes. You have to have a higher, higher risk for that to be effective. Um, and then the other thing I think is just maybe um, of interest to you is thinking about the biology of ovarian cancer in the first place. It's, I remember I showed you a picture of the ovary and that the cancer that's the most common cancer that forms is um, from the epithelium, the surface epithelium of the ovary, which is a very thin layer of cells that lay on the top of the ovary. Um, that ovary, ha those cells have access to the peritoneal cavity. So ovarian cancers are actually probably pretty small um, in the maybe one to two centimeter category before already cells are sloughing off and spreading into the upper abdomen and attaching onto the omentum and attaching onto the peritoneal surfaces. And already we're even talking about an early stage three cancer at that, at that time. So um, what we really need to focus on in ovarian cancer is uh, prevention. Um, and I think screening is going to be a challenge um, ongoing because of the biology of the disease, at least with the current testing that we have now, um, which is, is limited. But there are some things on the horizon. So um, right now for ovarian cancer prevention, which is um, I think where we have focused our efforts right now, these are the tools in our toolkit. Oral contraceptive pills decrease the risk of ovarian cancer by up to 50%. I have to do a lot of re-education with my patients about uh, oral contraceptive pills. I feel like back in the 80s or something, there were terrible formulations of um, pills, and people come in with all sorts of th thoughts that they cause cancer or that they're bad for you um, um, or that they cause breast cancer. It's not thought that they cause breast cancer. Um, um, they actually have been associated <laughs> with a small increased risk of cervical cancer, which is another one that I have to address. HPV is the problem with cervical cancer. Ovarian, uh, so oral contraceptive pills, uh, far and away, are our best tool in our, in our toolbox. Um, and um, the benefits are, are very long-lasting, and the ideal amount of time to be on oral contraceptive pills is somewhere around five to six years. So that's, uh, the benefit beyond that is um, not seen, and that may just simply be because we don't have enough folks to study. Yes, a question. It's a good question. Is there a reason that it's only oral contraceptive pills and not other kinds of birth control? So um, it all depends on how the birth control works, because um, the goal here is actually to decrease ovulation. And not all birth controls actually have that effect. For example, there's something called a copper intrauterine device, IUD. That is a, um, a piece of uh, a small device that goes inside of the uterus, and it irritates the lining of the uterus enough such that a Pregnancy, an egg and a sperm cannot effectively meet, um, but there is an egg, and you do ovulate when you are on the uh, when you have the copper um, intrauterine device. So that's not 
in the category of things that are thought to decrease your risk for ovarian cancer. So there are many, many types of methods out there, um, and I think we can refer to them as birth control in general, but what we're really after is decreasing ovulation. And so oral contraceptive pills tend to be the most effective at that. Yes, ma'am. Correct. There is no reason to take them after menopause. Um, because the ovaries at that point, uh, so the question was there would be no reason to take oral contraceptive pills after menopause, and that is correct. Um, after menopause, the ovaries are no longer ovulating, um, so there wouldn't be any benefit. Yes, ma'am. I think I'm uh, the, so the question was now that the women who are in their 70s, who were some of the first women to take birth control, um, that they're starting to see a decrease in uh, ovarian cancer. And that's a theory. So there was just this year, um, uh, uh, the SEER data or the, the registries that collect the national cancer data have seen that ovarian cancer rates have fallen by a bit, um, and there are um, lots of speculation as to why, why that may be true. Um, uh, and um, one of them is uh, oral contraceptive use. So I, I think that's hard to prove 100%, but it's a what we call an epidemiologic association, which is certainly very, um, very strong. Okay, so um, someone was, uh, so oral contraceptive pill use also seems to be effective in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers, which is, a, which is a, a important for the women who are not done with their childbearing and who have, um, are not uh, yet ready to have their ovaries and fallopian tubes re removed, which is the next thing we'll talk about, which is uh, risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy. So a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, otherwise known as a BSO, is a very common gynecologic procedure um, done for various reasons, usually in postmenopausal women. Um, there may be some strange mass on the ovary um, that that woman has had for a long time and discovered for other reasons. So we call that a BSO. Risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy, or RRSO, is a procedure done in um, patients who have a hereditary risk for ovarian cancer um, and um, the primary thing that's different about it, there are slight differences in the surgery, but the primary thing that's different about it is the pathologic examination. Um, so this is the fallopian tube there laid out, um, and the pathologists have realized that there are some precancerous lesions that can be detected in the fallopian tube or even small cancers that can be detected in the fallopian tube that only if they prepare the tissue and examine it in a certain way can be detected. So they have changed their protocol. Actually, I, I, I believe I'm correct in saying here at UCSF, all fallopian tubes that are removed for any reason undergo this type of evaluation now. Um, but um, that's not actually true everywhere. Um, and the reason is because, of course, we're a research institution and we're interested in these lesions in the fallopian tube. And I mentioned several talks back that the fallopian tube is thought to be, in many ovarian cancers, the site of the cancerous cells. So the cancerous cells start in the surface of the fallopian tube. They slough off and they land on the ovary. It's sort of the seed and the soil hypothesis. The ovary is the soil where they, uh, those abnormal cells can grow um, and uh, develop into... Um, and, and what we see clinically is oftentimes an ovarian cancer. A lot of times we can now see, now that we're looking closer at the fallopian tubes, a lot of times we can now see those precancerous fallopian tube lesions that may predispose, that may be the precursor lesion to the ovarian cancer. Um, so the process of risk-reducing salpingo-ophrectomy remove both ovaries and both fallopian tubes. It's recommended between the ages of 35 to 40 for hereditary patients who have an increased risk for ovarian cancer in their genes, discovered in their genes. Usually BRCA1 and 2, but there are some newer, um, there are some, we are discovering new genes that pre, that, and understanding the risk for ovarian cancer better each day in those different kinds of genes. Um, so it's very effective, decreases ovarian cancer risk by 90%. Um, and uh, actually, because we're removing estrogen, um, we also are decreasing patients' breast cancer risk. Um, why is it not perfect? Well, it does not eliminate this risk for peritoneal carcinoma. And I know when we were talking about anatomy, uh, but I'll just refresh your memory, the peritoneum is this 
Uh, again, surface lining, very thin layer of cells that lines the abdominal cavity. Um, almost every organ in the abdominal cavity is lined with this uh, peritoneum. Um, uh, all the bowel is, the abdominal wall, the uterus, the ovaries, these are peritoneal organs and they are kind of enveloped in this very thin layer. And that, appear, that arises embryologically when we are developing um, from the same tissue as the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. So it appears to be tissue that is at risk for developing this rare kind of cancer, a peritoneal carcinoma. Um, and of course, surgically, that's not resectable. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not resectable. It's not, we, we can't resect the entire peritoneum. Um, I suppose one could. It might be like three days of surgery or something like that. But, um, but the, um, but so we, we counsel folks who do have their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed that there is still this maybe 2% risk that they will still develop a peritoneal cancer. Um, and of course, it's, you know, it's a very invasive thing to do to somebody. It's very, it's fantastic that it decreases cancer risk, but it induces surgical menopause, which is a pretty severe thing to do to somebody. Um, uh, and it definitely affects bone health. Our um, estrogen is what protects uh, women's bones for a long period of their life. Um, and um, so uh, there are what we call comorbidities associated with uh, this type of surgery. Um, and we do find that when we take folks back for their risk-reducing surgery, about 10% um, of the time, we either find a precancerous lesion or a very early cancer. This next slide is the study that was um, first published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002 that uh, first demonstrated that uh, removing, ovarian, uh, uh, removing ovaries and fallopian tubes was um, life-saving for, uh, for this group of uh, folks. And so um, they randomized people to actually have the surgery or not have the surgery. So 259 women had the risk-reducing salpingoephrectomy and 292 controls underwent surveillance. Um, and they found an incidence of 20% ovarian cancer in the surveillance group and 0.8% uh, um, of the uh, women in the um, who had the risk-reducing salpingoephrectomy had a peritoneal cancer. That's the PPC, peritoneal, primary peritoneal cancer. Um, so very effective at um, reducing cancer risk. Um, interesting, in this study, they only discovered a 2% occult ovarian cancer risk. Um, this was actually prior to um, the protocol where they looked at the fimbria and of the fallopian tube, the area at risk for these precancerous lesions. So we actually think that probably that number would be a bit higher if the study was done today. This is Dr. Chen's slide about, um, she actually uh, has done a lot of research in this area together with one of the pathologists here at UCSF um, for exactly how to do this uh, type of pathologic sectioning, the special um, way to look at the fallopian tube. Um, and uh, lots of academic centers now do this type of um, serial sectioning, it's called. Um, and she's drawn some lines here. So the top slide here shows um, that what the fallopian tube looks like when you've cut it open and sort of flayed it out. Um, and so, oh, sorry, not quite yet. The, the, the OV stands for ovary. It doesn't look very white on that screen to me, but it looks whiter here. At any rate, that's the tiny little ovary, and then there's a fallopian tube. This is the part that's attached to the uterus, and this is the uh, fimbria, uh, we call it the fimbria of the fallopian tube, that kind of dangles down uh, in the body. It just dangles down on top of the ovary, and when an uh, ovary ovulates, it kind of um, has this peristaltic motion that helps move the ovary, uh, the egg, excuse me, down the fallopian tube into the uterus. So this uh, is going from outside to in. Um, and then this is uh, sort of demonstrating the way that the pathologists get this sectioned. And uh, they use a special instrument called a microtome in order to cut tissue like this. And then this is all the tissue that they have to then examine um, and make slides from um, to look at everything microscopically. Any questions before I move on to uterine? Uh, so the question is about ectopic pregnancy. Um, ectopic pregnancy risk is definitely increased in um, cases where there is scar tissue for one reason or another. Uh, what that means is um, someone might have endometriosis. It's a disease that causes significant scarring and um, abnormalities in the fallopian tube. Um, 
uh, just maybe to take your question one step further, once we remove the fallopian tube here, there is no more risk for ectopic pregnancy. Um, no more right, exactly. <laughs> Yes. This was a yes, I. It 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 actually still happens in Catholic hospitals. <laughs> um, I think there was a question in the back. Okay, um, so if I think I understand the question correctly, so peritoneal cancer in non-BRCA mutation carriers is the rarest of rare things. So when I said one in seventy women get ovarian cancer. Um, and 22,000 women get ovarian cancer. And we call ovarian cancer, just I should have clarified this potentially at the beginning. Ovarian cancer, it, we're actually trying to move to the terminology of high-grade serous pelvic carcinoma because fallopian tube, ovary, and peritoneal cancer are called high, are now under the umbrella of high-grade pelvic serous carcinoma. Um, they are all treated essentially the same. But of those three, ovary, fallopian tube, peritoneal, peritoneal is far and away the most rare um, in the general population. So there is no way to, um, there's really no way to screen for something that is so rare. It, that would be classified as a rare disease. Yeah. I see. So, so there are, um, uh, when uh, Julie Mack was here two weeks ago with me and talked about family histories um, and BRCA mutation carriers, there are women that she sees regularly in her clinic that have a high risk of ovarian cancer or high risk of cancer in the family, something that sure looks suspicious for a BRCA mutation in the family, but none is identified. So that means that there is probably another type of mutation in the family or combination of mutations that predisposes them to a risk for cancer. And so we frequently do try to estimate somebody's risk how it changes from your general risk in the population. So if we've decided in the general population, because we've done really good studies, we can't screen for ovarian cancer, then we have to decide in your family, how much higher is your risk? And is it worth considering doing a procedure that's invasive like this? And a lot of times, yes. So it's always a, just a discussion with the family and the patient themselves as to the risk and the benefit. And surgery is surgery. It's, it's dangerous. There's anesthesia involved. Um, um, there can be complications from surgery, so it's nothing that you want to undertake lightly and act like it's no big deal. It can be a big deal. Um, but it also can be life-saving, so those are the sort of be benefits and risks that you're constantly weighing. Okay, well, uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes here, so I leave room for questions, we'll talk about uterine cancer. Um, so the risk factors for uterine cancer. Um, uterine cancer is... Uh, Actually, probably our biggest risk factor in this country, and I talked about this uh, at one point with you guys, is body mass index. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more on, in a couple of slides. BMI, we hear about this because um, we know that this is an epidemic in our country. Um, and why is body mass index you know, related to uterine cancer? Well, that, ref that happens because of the estrogen. So estrogen is made by um, the ovaries. Um, but it is also made by other organs in our body, including our fat tissue. And so our fat tissue can produce, uh, does produce estrogen that can stimulate the uterine lining. And the uterine lining um, then, um, when it's stimulated constantly by a growth hormone, which is what estrogen is to the uterus, um, the, those cells become dysregulated. Um, they can develop precancerous and then cancerous lesions. Um, and so that's why uh, 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 the heavier one is, the more estrogen they're uh, producing from their fat cells that is causing stimulation, abnormal stimulation and growth of the uterine lining. Um, so similarly, if you go through menopause later, that means that you're ovulating longer and the uterine lining is still active. Um, Diabetes itself um, probably is more related to the combination of diabetes and obesity, um, uh, the, um, but uh, it does even come out in, when they try to regress out other factors that diabetes all by itself seems to be related to um, uh, an increased risk for uterine cancer. Um, related to the estrogen issue, never becoming pregnant, so the ovaries are constantly, are, are again, the, our source of, our major source of estrogen when we're premenopausal, and so um, 
the more exposure that your uterus has to that estrogen um, while the ovaries are ovulating. Um, now, the ovaries don't make a ton of estrogen when you are, say, breastfeeding or when you are pregnant. Um, the, there is um, that hormonal stimulation of the uterine lining is disrupted. Um, and then, of course, family history of uterine or colon cancer. And then there's this drug called tamoxifen, which is used for uh, breast cancer prevention. Um, after someone has a breast cancer, they take it for five, sometimes uh, five years at least, and that can um, cause the, uh, uh, stimulate the uterine lining. Um, so what are the symptoms that we need to be worried about for uterine cancer? Well, unlike ovarian cancer, uterine cancer is a lot more like cervical cancer because there is a, that uterine lining that we shed every month, that women shed every month when they have a period, um, that if it becomes dysregulated, those cells break off and they have bleeding. So unlike ovary cancer where 80% of the time we're diagnosing it at stage three, uterine cancer, it's the exact opposite. 80% of the time we're diagnosing it at stage one. And that's because people have a symptom of bleeding. And they present to their doctor and a biopsy is done, surgery is done, and usually it's a stage one cancer. And most of the time it's curative to just do surgery, remove the affected organ. Um, it happens, uh, I, Dr. Chen didn't put here on uterine cancer risk factors, but like all cancers, age is a risk factor. So when uh, it's common when a woman will have stopped her periods around 50, 51, she goes into menopause, and then maybe five or 10 years later, she starts having some bleeding. Oh gosh, that's abnormal. She goes and sees her doctor, gets her biopsy, and again, or usually an early stage cancer at that point. Um, if you actually develop symptoms of pressure or pain in the pelvis, that tends to be a cancer that is further along because um, these cancers are pretty small um, when they're in the early stages and they don't usually change the contours of the uterus such that you would feel anything. If um, a, a cancer has gotten larger, then it expands the uterine cavity and someone might feel some cramping or discomfort. Um, I don't think we talked about stages of uterine cancer before, but um, stage one cancers are in the first half of the muscle here, and stage, sorry, stage 1A cancers and stage 1B cancers have, have started to invade more than halfway through the muscle wall. Um, but they are isolated in the uterus and haven't spread beyond it. So routine screening, which means asymptomatic women just walking in off the street um, do not get screened for uterine cancer. Um, and that's because the test is um, invasive. Uh, a biopsy is, if anyone has ever had an endometrial biopsy, it's, um, it's much, much, much beyond just a speculum exam in terms of pain and discomfort. Um, the test is relatively expensive. Um, and then the other thing is um, it's hard to be more successful than we detect 80% of the cancers at stage one. Um, so it's hard for our screening tests to really improve on that situation because what we're really tr trying to do is find either precancerous lesions or find um, or that 20% that present at a later stage. Now we're talking about much smaller numbers of uterine cancer um, patients. And so finding a test for those folks um, is, um, is a bit more challenging. So that's why no screening. Um, but luckily, most women present with bleeding and do present with an early stage cancer. Um, 90% of women have postmenopausal bleeding, so that's a very, very common symptom. In patients who have uh, something called Lynch syndrome, so this is a family, this is again a genetic mutation that was something they were born with. Their families have increased risk for colon and uterine cancers. Um, there are special screening guidelines for that group of people. They get colonoscopies every year. They get endometrial biopsies every year. So that's a unique group of folks. Uh, prevention of uh, uterine cancer. So um, obesity increases uh, endometrial cancer risk by as much as tenfold. There's no, no other risk factor that increases it that much. Um, and it definitely affects how we can treat this cancer. So. Um, Nobody in this room is even close to obese, I can't say. Um, and that tends to be the case in an educated crowd in San Francisco, which is, which is great. But um, uh, as we were talking about socioeconomic status, 
um, that the food supply um, is uh, much different for our um, friends and neighbors who do not have the same kind of resources that we have. And um, so they um, are at higher risk uh, socioeconomic and, and, and um, they present when they present, sometimes they are very, very, very overweight, which makes surgery and chemotherapy and these kinds of treatments quite a bit more challenging. Um, and it certainly can affect how well the treatments work or what options we can we have to safely treat them. So um, we always talk to our patients about their weight and about how diet and exercise, and there have been some studies that show, like a lot of things, a small improvements in weight. And not, we're not talking about losing half of your body weight, but even just losing um, 10, 15, 20 pounds actually improves someone's metabolic profile enough sometimes that that estrogen imbalance that we, is the source of this problem um, can actually um, uh, improve their metabolic profile uh, with some weight loss, some modest weight loss. Um, so Dr. Chen likes homework, and I think she's assigned this to be your homework. So your BMI is your weight in kilos um, divided by your height in centimeters squared. Um, and so a norm, it actually is worth kind of keeping these numbers a little bit in mind. A normal body mass index is up to 24.9. If you're in the 25 to 29.9 range, you're overweight. And obesity is greater than or equal to 30. Um, last just minute or two here, I'm going to just talk about that Lynch syndrome that I touched on briefly because um, we do like talking about hereditary syndromes. They are... Um, a lot of, we learn a lot about these cancers from studying um, families that have increased risks for cancer. Um, so they looked at, um, this is a, again another study published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at risk reducing surgery for folks who have Lynch syndrome. So they looked at 380 women who had one of these mutations, so MLH1, MSH2, MSH6. And I'm pretty sure when I talked to you guys about genetics and genomics um, that we talked about mismatch repair proteins. Mismatch repair proteins are like the copy editors of our DNA. So um, if you put in the wrong uh, molecule of DNA, um, these proteins, when they're functioning properly, should excise that molecule of, protein, of DNA and put in the correct one. Um, but if these proteins are um, defective in one way or another, then they lose their copy editing abilities and the DNA accumulates a bunch of mutations or errors. Um, so they, um, uh, at uh, 41 years, um, these women, they ha looked retrospectively, so unlike the, our other study, patients were randomized, randomly assigned to one group or another, but they looked back and looked at um, uh, patients who had had prophylactic surgery and the incidence of uterine cancer was 0% after prophylactic hysterectomy and 33% in patients who kept their uteruses. So, um, and the other thing, we, we don't oftentimes think about this because uterine cancer is such a high risk, but there are actually um, uh, folks who have um, Lynch syndrome also have about a 10% risk of ovarian cancer. Um, so we do talk to them also about risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy. And so the incidence in this registry of ovarian cancer was 0% with 11 years of follow-up um, uh, and about 5.5% um, in the controls, and they followed them for 11 years. So um, that is the end of the talk about um, prevention and... Um, and screening for uh, our gynecologic cancers. And uh, you can go to the NCBI, um, uh, oh, it's actually NH, NHLBI, who has the um, BMI calculator. Uh, and I'm pretty sure if you type into Google BMI calculator, it's the first one that comes up. So I'll take questions. Ah, pap tests, 10 years after menopause. Um, so we rec, uh, help me out here, Karen. We recommend stopping pap tests after 65. Yeah, if you've always had a normal history. So if you've always had a normal history of pap testing, then you're allowed to stop at 65. If the history is abnormal, it depends a little bit in what way it was abnormal. Um, so um, that gets maybe a little bit granular for the discussion here. Um, but um, there are certain kinds of abnormal that are kind of low risk abnormal, and then there are certain kinds of abnormal that are higher risk abnormal. So um, that's something to talk with your gynecologist about. Yes. 
Actually, that's a great question. So the question is how, uh, since 90% of women um, have postmenopausal bleeding, how are we detecting uterine cancer in premenopausal women? So it turns out uterine cancer is incredibly uncommon in premenopausal women, with the exception of women who are um, very obese. Um, so what P what we are now aware of as as providers is that when women come in and they are having irregular periods. So there's various ways to have irregular periods. Um, and the one that we call, it's called anovulatory bleeding. So there's a bleeding pattern that suggests that the woman is not ovulating um, in a patient who has risk factors like she's very overweight. Then in that those cases, we would do a biopsy. Um, cause her, but her bleeding pattern would give us a clue that something was disordered in her uterus. Sometimes we do the biopsy and it's completely negative, um, but um, that's sort of the clue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of terminology out there about, uh, and I'll go ahead and teach you guys. So we, as doctors who do these surgeries, call a complete hysterectomy, we actually call it a total hysterectomy, is um, removal of the uterus and cervix. And then the second part of the surgery, it would, if we were going to do this, would be bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, where we would remove ovaries and fallopian tubes. Salpingo is the fallopian tube part. Oophorectomy is the ovary part. So um, the, the uterus really is, we, we a lot of times separate, because cervical cancer and uterine cancer are very different. We separate these organs, but they can really only be separated microscopically. When we look at that, when we do a total hysterectomy, um, and I look at the outside of the uterus, I can't be 100% sure where the cervix ends and where the uterus begins. Um, so, but there is such a thing as a supracervical hysterectomy, um, which is done for various benign reasons, things unrelated to cancer. But in the case of cancer, we always do a total hysterectomy. There are statistics. In fact, there's a lot of regional variation as well. Uh, so the question was, are there statistics that show that hysterectomy is going down or decreasing? Um, and there are um, nationwide statistics. I can't say that I'm up to date on them, but the general um, consensus is, is something uh, we talk about in our uh, institution here is that in California, um, they're very good at keeping the hysterectomy rates low, especially for women who don't, you know, if you have cancer, you have to have a hysterectomy. There's kind of no way around that. But if you don't have cancer, um, then you want to think about the reason that you're um, doing an invasive procedure. And a lot of times there are other medications or other strategies that we call medical management that are equally as effective as surgery or can be tried first before you use surgery as kind of the last ditch measure. But there is regional variation in this. So there are certain areas of the country where hysterectomy is still very common. Well, thank you very much for your attention tonight. It's our pleasure to be here with you again. <laughs> Thanks.